you for that very generous kind of uh, introduction to this topic and uh, good evening and everyone and thank you so much uh, to the uh, isaka bangalore chapter for having me over here today and uh, today i'll be sharing my views uh, on a rather alternative but a different take um on uh, how we view global politics and how it is shaping the cyber security realm and um, how we can really read the cues behind changing global events and its impact on security uh, some cases have been uh, taken in the presentation some from the past as well as some from the more recent uh, highlight this phenomena like uh, mr vaidhi correctly pointed out that uh, we will be also discussing uh what were the uh, the geopolitical ramifications behind uh, um behind that attack which happened in the united states and uh, more so the talk is structured in a way where uh, it actually looks at the global innovation in technology and the implications of technology and globalization um uh, we can then look at uh, the uh, then we can look at uh, globalization how it uh, how is impacted the emergence and the development and emergence of non state actors as we call them in international affairs where uh, there are alternatives to countries uh, or individuals or multinational corporations or certain groupings uh, which have become so powerful that they and they are thriving and using technology and especially uh, the cyber space to um, uh, to project themselves and of course uh, as the topic also reads we'll be looking at uh, Uh, looking at the centrality of cyber security in emerging covid-19 induced security situation so uh, some of the key points of assessments which we can expect and take for discussion after this presentation as well um uh, the the structure will also be somewhere uh, moving along these lines and so that it's a little easy for us to keep a tab on where we are moving ahead with the next slides and uh, the key aspects here would be to deal with looking at states earlier on in the impact of the geo space on the operations of cyber cyber security and what it holds for uh, professionals uh, who deal with this area so the uh, so before jumping into understanding um, understanding you'll be hearing this term as states uh, throughout this presentation here and generally in international relations it's a shortened version of what we call as nation states or how we describe countries in general uh, towards this so uh, so the so the basic question the first question we should be asking is do states still formulate or set the agenda when it comes to technology and of course as we have been seeing the progression of how new tech has been evolving and the answer to that is actually no so um, and often we find that uh, they are creating a trend based on certain national objective states to create they have a vision that uh, they want to be the leader in ai for instance like china has said uh, so they create uh, they create certain national objectives but due to complex nature of how the international system or international affairs work um uh, the uh, the global trade and commerce and the tech agenda is impacted by uh global as well as national level of politics which we need to understand if we are looking at futuristic technologies for instance uh which are developed so uh now let us look at this graphic and try to decipher the above assertion and look at how geopolitics and for that matter domestic politics impacts the tech agenda and the global trade now the here, here the key point is to note is the devolution of power when we say power uh, in generally in international affairs or international relations uh, the primary uh, source of uh, looking at um, how power is generated or who makes the decisions it's based on how we analyze based on states uh, states as in countries as the united states or india or china or south korea or japan um so here the point is to note that the devolution of power uh, uh, in setting the agenda is going away from countries as we see many of the top organizations or uh, uh, individuals who drive that organizations have stress they have gone beyond the idea where states can control or states or countries can control the way in which information is put out uh now let us take the example of the uh, most innovative company this uh, visualization is available online i have cited the source also below and uh, let us take the example of the most innovative company according to this survey and how the complexities of geopolitics impact the tech agenda and innovation 
Um, the company in question, for instance, Apple in 2019, um, uh, it supplies, uh, it, it uh, brings out a supplier's report and uh, compliance of how their uh, uh, supply chains are working or how they are uh, how their suppliers comply to enhance standards in various forms and others. And what you note is that uh, in the in 2019, in the report, they said that there are over 200 suppliers Apple has for all its products and uh, shows over 800 production facilities which are there um, uh, and which account for close to 98% of its procurement spread over multiple countries. Uh, but the catch here is that here is where geopolitics comes in and why it's important to note when we are also talking about uh, companies innovative, innovating or uh, coming up with new technology. So, for instance, if you look at that, uh, some countries in the whole supply chain have a very complex relationship. Uh, for example, let us uh, take for instance in the list, we can observe that there is China and then there is Taiwan. Um, obviously, uh, everybody is very much aware of how the complex, how complex the relationship is between both the countries. And or for instance, uh, we have China and Japan, uh, which also have a very complex relationship. How we see here is that uh, while all the three have, uh, have headquartered, like their various suppliers are headquartered in various different countries, uh, their, uh, their major, uh, major suppliers are again spread out with their production chains in China. So that makes it easier for uh, uh, companies which are uh, involved in this to uh, come together, uh, cutting down the geopolitical problems or the tensions which is there between that. And uh, so while countries speak about supply chain diversification, the complex underpinnings of geopolitics dominate this setup. Now let us uh, probe this idea further. And let's take the example of China as a case in point itself. So when we look at this, uh, while we have discussed the complexity and the over-dependence uh, it produces for organizations which are spread across multiple geographies, uh, this is where geopolitics comes in again. And uh, now this is at the global level. So let us look at how countries uh, which make business sense can leverage this position to meet their uh, global power ambitions through control over technology. Now, uh, taking China as a case in point, let us see. Our, Organizes, organizations forced to transfer technology and know-how? The answer is uh, maybe yes. So for instance, let me give you an example of uh, how a country can use or leverage its position as China has done in this case. So if you look in 2006, for instance, uh, a Harvard Business Review study found that the Chinese government uh, has been implementing new policies that seek to appropriate technology from foreign multinational, multinational uh, in several technology-based uh, specific industries where it targets as its growth areas. For instance, uh, the, uh, the focus has been on technology-based industries, um, high-speed rail, for instance, where now China has become one of the most competitive players across the globe, or for that matter, information technology. So there is a, uh, these rules, uh, for instance, uh, they limit investment by foreign companies as well as their access to China's market, uh, uh, Chinese, Chinese markets and stipulate a high degree of local content in equipment produced in the country. And also force, uh, this is very important to note, also force the transfer of proprietary technologies from foreign companies to their joint ventures in China's state owned enterprises. So in a way, uh, if you want to do business in China, you have to collaborate with a state-owned enterprise and they have to be your partner and technology has to be shared. Uh, so this is how, uh, for instance, one of the aspects which plays into why technology becomes important. And nevertheless, the whole point of contention, for instance, between the US and China has been largely relied in the space of this blurring line between private and state-owned enterprises. And um, for instance, uh, the control over uh, the Communist Party of China, which uh, runs the country. Uh, basically, uh, it's in the end, the top, top seven people who run the country and take all the decisions. It has a parliament and whatnot and others, but uh, the political system is in such a way that uh, it, uh, so how does this impact business? So for instance, in September, uh, China's, uh, China's Communist Party had urged, um, urged the uh, organization known as the United Front, for instance, to strengthen what in quotes it has cited as ideological guidance for the private sector 
and again create a core group of private sector leaders who can be relied upon during critical times now it is uh, not a very uh, very much of a surprise when we talk about this and uh, where this is coming from and if you would have followed the developments of what's happening between the united states and china in terms of uh, its trade war as they were termed uh, we see that uh, there has been immense pressure uh, on having control over the private sector in china with this regard and it uh, maybe it does not even meet the goals of what largely uh, the chinese state has in mind so do private organizations for instance foreign private organizations get embroiled in this geopolitical conflicts and are they forced to take a stand against what the stand has been uh, with regards to their home countries where they come from uh, so the answer again to this is yes so now let us go back to the top innovating uh, company from this uh, graph and let us just look at uh, how it had to comply with basically two dictates which uh, which china had given out and one with regards to uh, hong kong uh, where everybody must be definitely following uh, the protests in hong kong and what has been happening over there for a point of time and uh, the other with regards to uh, another restive region which is uh, the region of xinjiang uh, in china so uh, so let us uh, so let us look at uh, what has been the implication so uh, if we look at uh, 2017 for instance the chinese government asked apple to remove the new york times app from the chinese app store it had to comply with it contrary to the uh, position taken by the united states which was going against chinese tech companies uh, when we lo look at another instance uh, we can see that uh, uh, it again asked uh, ask apple to remove a app which was used by protesters in hong kong to uh, carry out various protests communicate with each other and again the question uh, again here apple had to comply so this goes very contrary to the point where uh, corporations are uh, are taking decisions uh, away from the uh, point of view of their home countries and uh, of course uh, this app had its own uh, own uh, technological backing to it and uh, they had to comply with uh, what was told to them so this is how uh, basically domestic policy geopolitical complications uh, have an impact on affecting uh, other countries and corporations which function there so coming down to understanding uh, looking at the us china trade war so the trade war uh, apart from the tariffs and others which uh, now for instance australia is caught up with china in regards to that how much of it was and is about high technology and uh, most likely all of it is about emerging future technology like 5g for instance uh, now while assessing the consequence of what the ban on huawei and why huawei the answer lies in the future scope of applications of uh, this technology in the military domain in the military domain um the applications of this technology for instance apart from the market value which it holds which is about uh, uh, by 2035 which is said to be estimated about uh, 12 trillion dollars uh future tech applications such as artificial intelligence for instance in the field of military technology uh these could work in strengthening military tech communications as well as battlefield superiority um, um so for instance if you take the example the congress congressional research service uh, uh, notes in one of its reports is that uh, 5g technology could for example in the future aid autonomous vehicles logistics maintenance and uh, for instance uh, uh, the communications over long distances can be much better and the reliance on satellites for instance could be much more decreased so there is a lot in scope for this uh, rather than only the commercial aspect of it which is uh, largely highlighted the military aspect of it, this it has much more and it can really revolutionize the way in which wars are fought or conflicts take place and uh, uh, of course the uh, of course the we have been seeing this across that uh, there has been a boycott uh, mostly based on the united states is uh, um following the united states on huawei and its applications everywhere across the world so uh, basically to uh, underline this point the so does the dominance in technology mean a dominance in the geopolitical space 
um, the answer again is yes. And uh, now throughout history, the dominance in the tech space has been wholly reliant on technological innovations. Uh, you take anything throughout history, it's uh, technological innovations which have happened, uh, which has shaped how countries or how the world goes ahead in terms of uh, most of these things. And uh, however, the true change which we see in the current context came only with the ICT revolution, uh, which came about. And however, as a medium became more oriented towards civilian applications over a point of time, the consequences became a tool uh, with which you used to control the outlet. So basically, the uh, devolution of power, which we talked about in the beginning, uh, we can see that how it has helped in terms of shaping the discourse in terms of geopolitics or politics. Um, this has created a new breed of actors who have power and influence who are known as non-state actors, though they live in the same system, but uh, they are not uh, specifically a state or a country which dictate policies or impact policies for that matter. So uh, let us uh, in this uh, let us in this uh, in this aspect look at uh, one um, one point of view. Um, these actors could be multinational corporations, for that matter, terror groups, or uh, just for a matter, angry people who do not like the government. It could also be the case. So, but what this has done is that it has uh, leveled the off, uh, often what we call as a conventional battlefield. Uh, there used to be someone who, uh, one actor who used to have a lot of power. Now there are multiple actors which have multiple power. So how do you uh, bring this capability together and how do we assess this? So some of the examples which we have seen over the, uh, over the past and uh, past decade, of course, and uh, it, which have been very prominent and seeing how decentralization of state power due to technology has taken place. Now, for instance, if we look at some of the examples, we look at the Arab Spring uh, in 2010, which happened in Tunisia, uh, a protest which was started uh, by uh, mobilizing or uh, mobilizing people over the internet, over ICT technologies, over uh, chat rooms and people coming together protesting and finally ended up um, in the, uh, ended up in the, uh, the basically uh, the country, I mean, the power being overthrown in Tunisia. It started with Tunisia, spread everywhere. Then of course it came in the realm of actual politics and it turned into something else, which we are seeing today in Syria and other countries. Um, uh, then the intensive use of ICT has led to communicative tech uh, to be used by terror groups such as the ISIS uh, in every process of causing terror from recruiting to execution of attacks or for that matter private organizations leading change when it comes to supplementing high technology previously uh, known as exclusive domain of states. Whether we see the leading technology which is coming in terms of uh, electric vehicles or in terms of uh, space technology, for instance, we see in the US, it is largely led by uh, private organizations. And uh, this has been largely possible due to this new fused tech environment um, and the use of ICT enabled technology. Uh, now, finally, just wrapping up this uh, section, what we can see is that uh, traditionally there has been a response in which countries react to certain type of environments. And uh, for instance, if you look at uh, internal regime stability or stability of the government or the state which is ruling, we see the traditional responses to use force, censor and punish or reform or legislate. Uh, when we look at uh, external relations and aggression towards states, we see the traditional response has been sanctioned war or diplomacy. Or whether for that matter, we see adversarial impacts on political stability from the outside, we see that it could be a combination of multiple factors which are used over here. But uh, coming towards technology, we need to see how technology changes, how nations respond to what they fear. And it's only through these various means. It's either through offense, through defense, through balancing these asymmetry or creating a deterrence over a point of time towards any of these threats. Um, now, uh, let us come to understand some cases of how states have been using the cyberspace to either bring in a that is offensive capabilities in difficult geopolitical environments, uh, balance their conventional capability through cyber capacity building, uh, build cyber deterrence to counter internal and external shortfall in capabilities, counter an asymmetric enemy uh, 
uh, which may be very different in terms of size or in terms of ability to expand power towards you or for that matter rise up the geopolitical ladder by economically sabotaging uh, the opponent so let us uh, let us understand one case in point and uh, chinese philosopher sun tzu actually very uh, categorically many thousands of years ago said attack is the secret of defense and defense is the planning of an attack uh, let's let's uh, go back to uh, 1981 and uh, on the left hand side you see a clipping from the original issue of the new york times in 1981 um, on learning that uh, iraq was uh, trying to set up a nuclear weapons facility um, israel launched something known as operation opera uh, where israeli jets destroyed a nuclear reactor on the outskirts of baghdad in 1981 with an air strike now the case of israel is very complicated in the middle east or west asia as we call it in the indian context um uh, nevertheless to put it in nutshell it is a nation which is surrounded by enemies on all sides and some who have adjusted to the reality of the setting due to their alliance commitments for instance with the us um nevertheless israel has always been proactive in taking actions uh, when it sees to be imminent danger to its survival and one of the examples is what we see in what happened in 1981 with regards to israel striking the uh, nuclear facility in iraq and uh, now let us fast forward to 2010 um there has been uh, there has been tension rising between us and israel against iran's nuclear program and by estimates uh, it was heading towards uh, enriching uranium to use for nuclear weapons and uh, one of the key facilities uh, which iran was using was uh, known as natanz uh, so natanz was an underground nuclear facility uh, um which was uh, one of the key enriching uranium for uh, building bombs nuclear bombs and uh, it was an existential survival threat and let us see how the response changed from 1981 to 2010 i mean though i wouldn't uh, say because there is no clarity yet on who who planted the malware uh, whether it was israel or whether it was the nsa or anyone else for that matter uh, but uh, here the idea is to uh, highlight how the modus operandi has changed in terms of the attack towards an adversary uh, years down the line so uh, the stuxnet uh, malware which was planted um, within the systems um, it went on to destroy close to 1000 centrifuges which were out of the 5000 in the natanz facility um, it did so by taking control and sabotaging uh, this whole uh, um, this whole facility and uh, speeding up uh, the centrifuges so they spun out of control and they got destroyed and uh, this by all means has uh, slowed down iran's nuclear program and its ambition to have a nuclear weapon so now let us analyze this attack and look at us uh, look at it from the perspective of uh, how uh, technology was used or how the cyber technology was used uh, in terms of infiltrating a physical system and destroying it and uh, uh, there is a recent book which has come out on this which is very interesting on how this operation was completely planned and uh, this has been termed as a first digital weapon which was used uh, in the in the space and um, it also highlighted the critical infrastructure vulnerabilities which are there for key facilities around the world and how it could be infiltrated over a point of time now this attack raised key questions on the intent and however like i said it has never been uh, substantially proven till date however uh, iran's nuclear however uh, it is not it is not much of a surprise to note that uh, uh, this had a very clear intent of uh, this had a very clear, clear intent of uh, attacking or attacking or was designed to attack facilities which belong to iran or the type of systems that they were using and uh, uh, this could uh, very well be attributed to any of the players in the geopolitical space who wanted to stop iran's nuclear program and um, of course uh, as with any type of an attack uh, uh, though it was not intended there were other collateral damages for other organizations based out of the us for instance 
now uh, look let's let us look at the case of how countries balance uh, conventional asymmetry uh, by having cyber parity uh, for instance uh, we can take the case of uh, north korea north korea is a country which remains closed off uh, all that you hear about north korea is something um, you wouldn't expect out of 2020s as a country uh, most of the time the image which is shown is of an oppressive country a dictator who's running the country and uh, people who are starving and suffering uh, technology is probably not something um, for a common person a technology is not something that you would really associate with a country like north korea but uh, it has become an interesting ca uh, case to understand the linkages between geopolitics to cyberspace and the cyber domain and uh, while north korea functions as a completely isolated country cut off from the rest of the world um, its operatives backed by the states such as the lazarus group or its notorious military intelligence uh, launches state backed organized attacks so here there's no syndicate within the country the country itself is the syndicate and uh, uh, it targets uh, various institutions financial institutions for instance uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, biggest attacks was on bangladesh's central bank where they managed to steal uh, a large amount of the money which they had targeted and uh, here of course again the interesting link is to uh, the question which is raised again is that how does how does a country like north korea which does not have access to the outside world which actually chooses not to have access with the outside world or for that matter uh, does not really uh, to be known to be on the cutting edge of technology uh able to get uh, this type of an uh, access or this type of a training um for instance uh, the the answer is simple uh, it has relations with a few countries and those few countries uh, prove as a very important aspect for them to get training and get trained as well as carry out attacks uh, on uh, other uh, institutions or countries uh, for instance uh, here is a very interesting link uh, between for them with china and europe to answer the question is where they practice their skills in the real world uh, they go to universities either in china uh, where they have access and learn the technology and come back and they become part of the state apparatus uh, one of the examples is of a unit within the within north korea's military intelligence which specializes in this type of tactics um is uh, unit 121 which was given the mission of attacking a foreign nations infrastructure such as transportation networks telecommunication electric power nuclear power um, you name it any type of critical infrastructure so they have specific uh, groupings uh, made to target specific areas and so probably um, so probably we wouldn't have expected this uh, from north korea but they have become uh, one of the one of the countries uh, which have in the forefront of uh, carrying out cyber attacks on various type of uh, organizations or countries and uh, this again is a result of uh, how the geopolitical situation has shaped this country and uh, the type how the leadership has used this situation to actually come out of sanctions which have been placed on them it is approximately understood that uh, north korea earns about uh, close to 2 billion dollars through these type of activities um uh, now of course uh, let, let us look at another case uh, of uh, how conventional settings or conventional conflicts um uh, help in terms of understanding uh, where countries can um get their uh, capabilities assessed from and so uh, so for instance uh, vietnam and china are embroiled in uh, the south china sea dispute it it is a dispute which is which lies of the coast uh, of vietnam and china uh, where there are contested islands and contested waters <clears throat> though there is no clarity on who owns what and uh, these type of skirmishes are quite frequent between countries uh, uh, throughout this region and uh, during one of the instances in early 2000s uh, uh, a chinese uh, chinese cyber uh, cyberspace task force was identified as uh, the 61398 unit and it acts against government defense contractors private technology corporations and does espionage basically in terms of getting uh, sensitive information data and also tapping into systems and uh, one of the attacks which happened on uh, vietnam 
for instance, was after uh, there was a skirmish between Vietnam and China off the coast. And uh, this is how it was come to, uh, Vietnam has officially announced that it has a cyber army, which cracks down not only internally in terms of dissent, which comes from its own citizens, but also outside of the country towards China and directed towards hostile countries. And uh, uh, when you note this, uh, one of the key factors is that uh, this, um, this, task, uh, this task force, which is there within uh, the cyber task force, um, it also, um, the US, uh, US Congress, uh, for instance, when one of the hearings is noted that close to $400 billion a year is stolen in terms of intellectual patents from the US. And largely, uh, barring the politics which is going on right now between US and China, uh, it's attributed largely to China. Um, now, when we come to look at this situation or this case, it is very interesting to note how it uh, differs in terms of the perspective on how a powerful country or uh, powerful military counters an asymmetric threat or a non-state actor. And uh, one of the interesting cases, and uh, right now the official documentation has been uh, released on uh, this Operation Glowing Symphony which uh, the US uh, military uh, carried out uh, as in part of its uh, cyber attack against the, uh, against the ISIS. And uh, uh, the ISIS, of course, uh, there is a whole lot of literature to understand how it uh, uses encrypted apps, social media, or splashy online magazines and videos to spread its messages, propaganda, and also uh, attract uh, people uh, to uh, launch attacks on their own or come and join the caliphate uh, before what it was, uh, before now it was taken down. And um, one of the key aspects of Operation Glowing Symphony was that it was uh, the first type of an attack uh, which was targeted and carried out towards a particular group by a state entity. So um, this was, uh, I, mean, I mean, in a formal setting, a state entity. So um, uh, one of the one of the uh, one of the uh, reasons from the uh, one of the thoughts from this uh, report is that uh, the uh, the report highlights as to what is the difference between carrying out an actual air attack, let's say a drone attack or uh, dropping a bomb, on uh, as opposed to carrying out uh, a targeted digital attack, and uh, and it, it has been very successful in taking down one whole network in terms of the uh, ISIS. And uh, of course, uh, last but not the least, let us come to understanding what recently happened with solar winds. And I'm sure that uh, this, this comes largely under what has been happening as an operation for a very long time uh, in terms of uh, state-backed hackers, um, whether it's from China or Russia or any other countries. And, um, they followed a focused and a determined approach in terms of uh, getting new technology or identifying how technology works. And uh, while uh, cybersecurity specialists uh, really very clearly highlight um, that uh, how this uh, system works and uh, how uh, technology or how data is stolen from uh, these areas in terms of industrial espionage or cyber industrial espionage, what we uh, do tend to understand is that uh, the extent to which these systems are vulnerable to attack. And however, as a case in point, let us try to understand uh, how a combination of a lapse in uh, the hardware supply chains, for instance, which have been the weak points uh, when we see in most of the cases and how, uh, how any type of an attack has been planned or planted in terms of into critical uh, systems and uh, how uh, when it is uh, mixed in terms of uh, in terms of a combination uh, with uh, with a human plant within a physical system and how does it how does it help in terms of understanding the differences so one of the cases to understand this apart from what's happened with solar winds is uh, uh, one of the cases was developed by CrowdStrike and uh, it's an in-depth case in deconstructing how uh, the Chinese intelligence um, uh, got industrial technology for, uh, for a jet it was building uh, in terms of uh, its engine, 
intellectual property patents and technology and how it was uh, done with a combination of using human intelligence techniques and as well as um, as well as using uh, the cyber space or the cyber uh, area in terms of understanding um, how we are uh, getting through and uh, for example uh, the example which i'm talking about is uh, about uh, how a, how a technology was stolen uh, on behalf of commercial aircraft corporation of china um, from cfm uh, which was uh, a bidder in terms of uh, developing new engine technology for uh, for the country and um, this began with a once once a contract was signed uh, a group named turbine panda began cyber operations to pilfer data from cfm and uh, they had sent it back to the organ to china state owned organization uh, comac and uh, with this uh, this was one of the ways in which technology was taken and along with this this was used with uh, a different type of uh, intelligence unit which was successfully tapped in uh, through a front company uh, into uh, into getting the state of the art engine uh, design and technology from uh, uh, through their contacts in the uh, intel in the military as well as with uh, gm which was the company which is there so uh, this has been happening for uh, for quite some time and all these have a, a geopolitical ramification behind that as to why countries do these kind of things why do they steal technology or why do they uh, why is there a theft in intellectual property uh, which is uh, which is there abroad uh, these give you economic leverages and this give you economic edge in terms of uh, projecting your country and uh, that now we can relate this to why there was a huge problem with uh, 5g technology because uh, the technology was being led by uh, by chinese companies such as huawei and uh, if they did break in and they did have a hold on it Uh, controlling airways of these uh, your airways or your networks have become much more important than let's say seaways which probably was uh, the most important thing of the past when i talk about geopolitics now uh, let us look at uh, let us look at uh, sorry my slide is frozen so when we looking at changing nature of conflict and the cyber space uh, there is a i being a student of international relations i remembered a very in, important and interesting book uh, which was based on uh, how we win wars it was a theory of what we call as asymmetric conflict how a strong actor and a weak actor interact with each other in a battle now this was a physical space and the example was of uh, why america lost the vietnam war and uh, these are the questions which ivan toft looks in his book Uh, how we win wars and uh, we can analyze some of the uh, from some of the cases which we have looked at we can also analyze why uh, the nature of conflict has changed and why state strong or for that matter weak or asymmetric uh, use uh, cyber attacks or cyber security uh, cyber attacks uh, in terms of uh, projecting their power and some of the be benefits for instance include uh, it achieves a larger geopolitical objective without much collateral damage which we saw in the case of uh, the first instance of uh, the stuxnet attack or the economic incentive uh, which is there in terms of helping the economy of a certain country growing which we saw in the case of industrial espionage or it becomes an informal channel uh, which uh, really an attack cannot be pinpointed with uh, precision uh, but we can only make assumptions that based on certain patterns this is how it had emerged and uh, the difficulty to trace now in uh, how how we win wars uh, there is a strategic in interaction winning probability which uh, even tof talks about and uh, this is from the perspective of a stronger country and uh, this is how the interaction works but what is interesting in the cyber domain is that uh, the dynamic of cyber warfare um, is used by the most powerful as well as the most uh, weakest country and fairly uh, it is able to achieve the same result and a good result a fairly good result for either of them this is how the paradigm is very different when we apply it to the cyber domain uh now uh, 
uh, coming down to the second part of the uh, part of the talk and uh, where we are looking at geopolitics the cyberspace and covid-19 obviously um, the world has changed uh, and as uh, in the starting comments um, it was mentioned that this is going to be an unforgettable year for many years to come um, but uh, other than of course if there are no worse things to happen um uh, this is going to be remembered as a year which uh, challenged uh, global security um any type of security you ask them it has been challenged by this year and um, on the right hand side if you see this is a report which covid came out with in march 2020 in terms of looking at uh, the impact on uh, the geopolitics and how covid-19 impacted the different parts of uh, security and this is one uh, part of the report on uh, cyber security the link is below you can uh, probably check it out on a linkedin page and uh, but uh, what covid-19 has done is that it has in one hand technology has been a boon in terms of uh, business still moving at least uh, to an extent and we have had to adapt to a highly tech dependent environment um we have become completely uh, reliant on it infrastructure to drive everything including the stock for instance which is happening which would have happened in person otherwise but uh, it has made us uh, altogether incredibly vulnerable uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, attacks and uh, from uh, on the right hand side if you see that was in march 2020 when we were just trying to figure out um what is happening with the covid-19 which was uh, and uh, the cyber space was filled with of course with uh, phishing attacks uh, misinformation campaigns about uh, what to do what not to do and uh, state led campaigns as well in terms of uh, attacking uh, other countries and putting out fake uh, notices official notices on those countries so that it can confuse the citizens but uh, however as we have moved on to q2 of 2020 uh, this report uh, which came out in november um, highlights that uh, there has been one trend which has been occurring ransomware attacks have gone up by close to 40% in the first three quarters of 2020 and we see that science and technology sector accounted for close to 91% increase in the threat detections so this says a lot in terms of what is the target and where is the target of the attack in terms of which are happening um now let us uh, look at what are the new what are the trends in the security environment and uh, let us uh, understand this um the whole definition of what is critical infrastructure itself has changed probably new vectors of threats need to be identified and new sectors need to be considered critical in these times uh, for instance if you look at mandatory applications for instance that has been one more thing um if you do remember that uh, um the division which i had uh, rhymes with a very infamous uh, which uh, corresponds to the very infamous program which was run by the uss nsa uh, called prism which uh, was on surveillance so the idea is that uh, the whole idea of monitoring and uh, weak security protocols which support this monitoring applications could make it easy for hackers and of course government to monitor their citizens so privacy remains a very key aspect of uh, the security environment uh one of the other aspects is on uh, the remote working infrastructure vulnerabilities this has been talked about quite a lot in terms of uh, what has been changing uh, with the security environment and of course uh, uh, one of the key aspects which is going to be driving and which is a trend is uh, apart from when the 5g technology gets implemented and when it's in space it's going to dynamically alter the way in which uh, we are going to interact um, not only it's not only dependent on how the military space uh, interacts but also the human space interacts or how the impact is going to increase in terms of our in terms of our uh, environment security environment now of course uh, looking at geopolitics and reliance on the cyber space in the age of covid-19 what we see is that covid-19 has to a great extent caused a lot of geopolitical instability which is directly correlated to wars and conflicts due to regime instability um whenever you see whichever uh, whichever region across the world uh, for instance if you look at the sahel region of africa conflicts have continued to happen despite of covid-19 
recently also you would have seen that uh, uh, a number of school children were abducted by the boko haram and uh, so wars and conflicts have continued throughout uh, the covid 19 period and today and uh, that geopolitical instability is there but uh, what we are seeing as a trend which has developed is the technological threats uh, which have emerged for instance uh, from covid 19 uh, one it not only affects state stability or a country's stability uh, by attacking its different systems or uh, because uh, the guard is down in terms of how people are working or how people are interacting. Our reliance on technology might uh, be, uh, be compromised if you are working with uh, systems which are compromised. Um, but also for that matter that it impacts COVID mitigation measures, which I'll touch upon in the next slide on how it is intrinsically linked to technology and why we need to look at uh, this from the aspect of uh, looking looking at this from the aspect of state security and uh, human threats linked to technology have also become uh, important the insider threat has forever been one of the biggest mysteries i would say of uh, how do we tackle this security threat within any organization or a critical organization or for that matter a corporate organization um, uh, but uh, the handling of critical infrastructure of key technology with uh, such insiders uh, has been uh, one of the key aspects of uh, how we have to look at uh, the cyberspace in the age of COVID-19. Um, violent non-state actors accessing technology, when I say violent non-state actors, I mean uh, terror groups, and insurgent groups, those who cause violence, uh, extremist groups who cause violence. Uh, these are human threats linked to technology, which uh, need to be looked at as well. Um, them accessing technology in a time of a pandemic becomes extremely dangerous. Uh, we have seen this in terms of uh, uh, in terms of how attacks, for instance, have continued uh, in Europe or any other countries, uh, any other places across the world, uh, where attacks have. Uh, continued. We have seen radicalization happening through the internet, uh, which has led to the carrying out of attacks. And uh, of course, if we move on to looking at uh, the COVID-19, um, the sec how it has specifically affected uh, various aspects. Um, we see that uh, we can look at them from the perspective of uh, various institutions or organizations or others. And uh, cybersecurity is, of course, the key aspect of effectiveness in the fight for COVID-19, apart from, of course, the vaccine, which is the most important thing. Uh, maintaining uh, cybersecurity is also important. Um, in, the, in the starting months of uh, 2020, um, from the time at least uh, we have gone into a lockdown, we realized that uh, the first line of attacks were on institutions, such as the WHO, for instance, to uh, to attack, WHO was attacked in terms of stealing credentials and access uh, towards the institution by uh, those stakeholders who wanted to break in and uh, get uh, the uh, get the various technologies. Um, the European Medicine Agency, for uh, instance, was attacked recently in uh, to get data about uh, um, the vaccine and the emergency applications of the vaccine. And uh, attacks on medical facilities have also occurred uh, most of the times throughout the pandemic period. And we look at this multiple attacks, for instance, uh, one attack was had happened in France and Germany. Um, one happened in the United States uh, where uh, healthcare systems were attacked, uh, slowing down the uh, response to the pandemic situation. Um, the attack on foreign missions and government also uh, happened in terms of uh, the attack on Chinese um, uh, Chinese embassies across the, uh, consulates and embassies across the world were also attacked uh, through a vulnerability uh, vulnerability in the security patch, which was uh, supposed to be put up for the for their remote access systems. And of course, we had solar winds as well. Uh, the implications of this. Uh, are being deciphered uh, slowly but steadily, but a lot of government agencies, including, for instance, the uh, not only the US, but across the Atlantic in the, in the UK, for instance, the NHS is also looking, uh, which is in the crucial role right now of uh, distributing the first round of vaccines, um, is actually uh, 
uh, has also said that it might have been breached because of this uh, this whole issue and uh, we see the attack on private organizations uh, conducting vaccine research for instance oxford was attacked uh, their email uh, emails were intercepted in terms of data which was being shared between uh, various research groups and the um, and the vaccine maker and uh, these were also one of the type of attacks which happened uh, specific to covid-19 and um, also organizations which were uh, conducting vaccine trials were also attacked so the motivations for uh, this type of attacks uh, especially i mean uh, in co in common uh, thought or common sense we would say that uh, in times of a pandemic who is free to launch a cyber attack there are a lot of people who look at such opportunities and uh, of course uh, uh, there is a lot of economic value to be gained states uh, state backed uh, uh, hacker groups or uh, sponsors who want to get ahead in terms of getting the data of vaccines or uh, any type of uh, scientific development which can be stolen from foreign countries uh which can be used by their own scientific uh, community to come up first with the vaccine or any type of a cure uh not a complete cure but any type of a, any type of a forward movement in the fight against covid-19 uh this of course adds to the global prestige and standing of countries and uh, industrial espionage like we had seen in the previous case was also one of the uh, key aspects of uh, how this works so uh, uh, let us come down to understanding the industrial cyber espionage part of it and uh, the covid-19 vaccine they have happened on these uh, these three vectors and uh, the data theft has of course been very common and the reason for attack on facilities which are conducting research but uh, lately as we are noting that uh, most of some of the vaccines need a specific type of cold storage chains and uh, recent attack uh, an ibm study actually uh, pointed out that there was an there was a there could be an attack or there was an attack on uh, one of the cold uh, storage supply chains and this is one of the vulnerable points in terms of uh, what could be uh, uh, what could be hurt in terms of our fight against covid-19 now what are the continuities and discontinuities uh, coming to the last section uh what are the continuities and discontinuities in the post covid world if we look at and uh, what we do uh, realize is that the cyber security as an integral part of the geopolitical decision making uh, will continue to be important so let us look at uh, three areas and uh, businesses and investments will of course uh, definitely change so one of the aspects is looking at strategic sector investments uh, and uh, in terms of foreign countries now uh, when we look at fdi or uh, any type of foreign direct investment which comes in different countries what we realize is that uh, there are certain incentives which are given to foreign countries to invest let's say in india or china or vietnam or any other developing country uh, in the future uh, this is going to be a very important case uh, a cyber secure assurance uh might become a very important aspect of what would attract investments in a certain country uh global trade and supply chain vulnerabilities uh, will continue to persist and uh, uh, safeguarding these uh, against cyber attacks will become one very important aspects and uh, when i say major sectors so strategic sectors it could be in terms of defense and aerospace or in terms of uh, uh, global trade and supply chains or manufacturing or or any other aspect which are of critical importance to a to a country and uh, war fighting will of course change uh, conventional wars have already become fragmented uh, they are fought between asymmetric actors um, probably uh, after a long time we saw an actual conflict in nagorno karabakh recently uh, between armenia and azerbaijan and uh, other than that it has just been asymmetric attacks or attacks which are done through other means uh, which we have explored in the previous parts of this presentation and uh, war fighting uh, will become more tech intensive and more asymmetric um, when i say more tech in uh, tech intensive uh, what it means is that it could uh, get um, 
it could it could become an important part where we look at uh, technology and how it is changing the face of warfare like we discuss in terms of the 5g technology and how it will change the face of warfare artificial intelligence and also uh, remote warfare which we are seeing right now uh, where drones are used for instance uh, in hostile conflict zones uh, where the collateral damage is uh, next to nil unless uh, uh, only the loss of technology for drone is shot down for instance and uh, let us look at the uh, third aspect which is the uh, cyber defense and deterrence uh, deterrence will be driven by a concerted set of state and semi state actors um, uh, like like we had discussed in the beginning we see that uh, the state actors uh, there is a devolution of power and uh, technology and research is moving or driven more by uh, uh, private players or private actors. So there would be a concerted effort in terms of both working together. And uh, dual use technology interfaces will see more focus in terms of defense capabilities, um, whether it's in terms of outer space or whether it's in terms of uh, military technology or capability, we see that this is uh, coming true. Um, last but not the least, uh, the most obvious but uh, probably the biggest mystery is how do we maintain the human quotient uh, remains the most crucial aspect of uh, building a robust security design when we are talking about any type of a structure. And uh, despite technology or any other innovations, um, uh, the human threat remains very key in terms of uh, identifying how do we tackle security. So what are we expecting in the near future? Um, we are seeing stunted globalization, as we call it, um, and a permanent vulnerable tech environment. Uh, we might be working remotely or from anywhere for a very long time uh, as structures start to slowly normalize, uh, but a lot of it will be reliant on technology. And uh, unstable trade environment, uh, which will drive, drive a lot of asymmetry and uh, uh, a technology dependent autonomous system in business processes, which we are seeing is changing over a point of time. Um, in terms of conflict, what we are seeing is that wars will become costlier. Wars have already become costly. Uh, fighting a war drains out an economy, but wars will become costlier to be fought. So asymmetric attacks will be at the fore and uh, the cyber and tech uh, area will actually revolutionize warfare in the times to come. And uh, hybrid warfare, as we call them, where uh, there are various means and various vectors in which uh, conflict happens. And uh, we see that violent non-state actors will innovate challenging, uh, challenging the states, uh, whether it's in terms of technology, whether it's in terms of tactics. Uh, so let's move on to the discussion with some pertinent questions to ponder on. So how does geopolitics now figure in cyber auditing and uh, how do we respond to incidents keeping in mind the geopolitical consequences of a response is one more thing. And what is the future of key sectors where we see a fusion of response required where the interface and actors are not clearly defined. So I will just leave it here and hand it back to uh, our organizers. And uh, I think we'll go ahead with some questions. Thank you so much. Hey, Vignesh, thank you very much. Very, very lively, interesting session. Uh, brings in a completely different, uh, uh, you know, connotation, a dimension to the way we have been looking at cybersecurity. We have been looking at from the point of, you know, risk, audit, and technology. Uh, and whatever you have discussed here, I can see has, you know, actually got an implication on all those three factors which we talked about. Uh, Vignesh, I think, you know, we have a few questions and if I can read out that question, yes, Steve, sure. you know, and yeah. the person who has asked a question and we will take more questions as we go ahead. Please feel free, this is an interesting topic. Formulate your questions and Vignesh, as I listen to you, your session, I myself have some questions. Uh, sure. <laughs> I will Thank definitely you. come back. So, here. so shall I just take the questions uh, from the Q and A box? Yeah, you can take it up. Uh, you can start with Mr. Mukul Mandal, who has asked the okay. first question. Right. So the question is: um, Are we, as we are moving to automotive environment and artificial intelligence, then with respect to information security, what is the future do we have in cybersecurity, 
and which certification or type of knowledge will help us. Um, uh, I, th I, I think you can start with uh, Isaka Bangalore chapter. They may be able to help you with that. Um, but uh, jokes apart, uh, I would uh, like to say that uh, like, we, like we discussed in the slides as well, um, there was a lot of uh, lot of lot of thought in terms of uh, where this is heading where where do global how do you factor in global politics with all the innovation which is happening and um, the artificial intelligence and uh, automotive environment will definitely drive questions in terms of not only understanding the technical aspects um, but uh, my my assessment or my question would be also on understanding how it is going to affect us in terms of how we work or how it is going to alter the environment in which we work. And uh, that, that would be one of the key aspects of uh, knowing um, uh, how structures are changing, how do we need to monitor in terms of uh, uh, the human quotient, for instance, in an automated environment or one which is driven by artificial intelligence. Of course, there are, uh, th there are a lot of fears uh, in terms of what happens to uh, the traditional environment where we have people who analyze situations or people who take calls or uh, innovate um, what will happen with the automated environment. So I, I think I think that would be the direction in which uh, I could see this. I think uh, I think uh, I guess I've I've put my point of view on that. Um, I just move on to the next question um, in looking at uh, considering work from home scenario. Employees might need be asking the family members to use their system. Um, how do we ensure such risks are mitigated to any kind of solutions? Um, this has actually been a very much discussed topic in terms of vulnerability of home systems as opposed to uh, systems which are used in companies, organizations which have better security protocols in place. Um, uh, one of the aspects could be that uh, you just don't give access to anyone else. Um, and you have a dedicated system which uh, is has certain security measures or uh, security measures which are built and put in place uh, where nothing else is accessed from. Um, but that said, uh, I think uh, certain uh, general aspects of how we maintain uh, what we can term as cyber hygiene, we keep that in place. And uh, probably the third, uh, question is on Israel. So uh, what are your views on Israel blowing up a building to stop, stop a cyber attack? Uh, will it become a standard tactic in the in the future? Um, I think you're referring to, again, the second attack which happened on the Natanz facility uh, in Iran. And um, apart from that, uh, look, uh, when it comes to Israel from, a, uh, from an international relations uh, student or a person who's following it for the past decade point of view, I can tell you that Israel is a realist state and, uh, and it is surrounded by hostile neighbors on all sides, which either do not acknowledge its uh, existence or have openly threatened to destroy the country uh, with uh, fanaticism or with nuclear weapons or with uh, fueling conventional conflict. So when it comes to that, uh, it's a matter of survival and uh, that is the key aspect of any country's existence. So uh, they have been using it from the past. Uh, they have used various techniques to uh, stop any type of an attack on its citizens or avoid any type of a catastrophe which happened during World War II to the Jews. So um, in that sense, um, the, uh, they have been using the cyberspace and they continue to use it and uh, in terms of protecting the national interests. So uh, the next question on where does citizen privacy lie in the information warfare uh, target? So uh, this in my view, and uh, uh, probably uh, probably uh, someone from Isaka can also add on to this. And uh, privacy is actually, uh, I mean, we go with a very fundamental or a basic philosophy uh, when we do study political science or international relations, um, that uh, we have a social contract uh, with states or with countries where we hand over our rights to the state to say that you protect us. Um, uh, this is known as a social contract. And uh, but in that aspect, if we if if the state is not able to reach that, uh, there is also an idea that. Uh, 
it's not worthy of protecting your rights so the idea on privacy and when it crosses over to uh, from protection of rights to and uh, and uh, protection of rights moving towards uh, uh, moving towards what we say as invasion of privacy uh there is there is actually a very thin line and as we are voluntarily giving up information in terms of social media or in terms of uh, how we are communicating over uh, the internet um, i think there's probably nothing left in terms of within the open source you can really get anybody's information these days um, but a more nuanced a more targeted type of information where you would want to implicate someone for instance through a through the digital space um, that's that's probably going to be the key area and the changes in technology is actually um, the changes in technology is actually uh, driving that uh, driving citizens and states uh, towards that blurry line and uh, one more question on how about india as a state prone or vulnerable to cyber attack i mean uh, this is a, this is this is a very broad i mean i i feel it's a very broad based question so i i would uh, rather skip this and uh, how equipped is india as a state in cyber attacks particularly covid vaccine manufactured coming up from india uh, so definitely uh, protocols have been in place and uh, over the years there has been a focus uh, uh, rather than moving from only saying that india is an it superpower to actually acting in terms of developing protocols and building um, uh, building these uh, type of uh, structures in place which uh, are able to are able to say are able to secure the uh, security environment which is there and uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the vaccines and manufactured uh, there's already this attack has been happening all over the world in all types of facilities it's not only related to india and uh, in one of the slides i did uh, uh, highlight or identify um, identify that this could be one of the areas uh, which could be vulnerabilities for some time to come for our country so uh, we do have a system set up in place but uh, um, a breach has already happened so that raises a lot of questions definitely um okay uh, this question is anonymous so uh, i will probably take that up as well um um here it said that you have mentioned about mandatory monitoring application give data access to what is the implication when such an application developed in private company using the uh using the odc model example arogya setu so again this question uh, also also lies in the realm of uh, citizens privacy versus a state uh, state securing your uh, securing your environment or securing you against an existential threat and um, uh, the actually the uh, the protocol or the uh, thing which is followed uh, one it's of course uh, um though the mandatory part of it uh, was uh, was uh, struck down by the country's courts they did say that you may you can have it it is good but uh, it goes against the policy of making it mandatory for everyone to have it and uh, of course uh, for instance if you looked at uh, looked at uh, in one of the examples when i spoke about china for instance uh any type of uh, this uh, technology which is used uh, uh, for instance with regards to their access or those who are accessing uh, data with specific apps uh, uh they made it a mandatory law that uh, the data has to be stored in servers in china and uh, any of the tech companies have to give them access whenever they require and for we can understand in a country like india at least we have to have the due process in place till now in which uh, if there is some infringement on rights you can go up to the supreme court but over there it's just an understanding that uh, uh, if if there is an under, if it's understood that there is a threat to uh, the state or the party uh, it is very clearly um, an order is very easy to get so in that sense uh, that's again the blur blurring line between uh, security and policy so um apart from that uh, data security protocols put in place uh, 
uh, need to be extremely extremely strong apart from having the ability to uh, looking at looking at whether uh, you know a, a company uh, goes about in terms of giving your data or selling your data to anyone else um one more question on uh, okay i think this is a follow up question i think on the nuclear one on israel so it says i meant how attractive it is for attacking a nation to target citizens directly like it happened in the us um uh, it is it is it is highly likely because uh, when you attack any type of a facility there is always a damage for instance if we drive it from the perspective of uh, let's say we we derive this from the perspective of nuclear uh, studies what we do uh, look at uh, is that uh, there is a counter force and a counter value type of an attack uh, where you attack civilians or you attack uh, only facilities avoiding civilian damages so uh, in the cyber realm as uh, the devolution of power is happening throughout the society what we do see is that this impact is actually being felt on those who use the technology as well as governments because in the end uh, some technologies uh, do provide some services and uh, it impacts um, it impacts the uh, technology um uh, uh, so shall i take the questions further or uh, yeah, yeah. we guys should please go ahead and take the questions we have some time but i think you know people are warming up and there are a lot of questions right, right, right. sure 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 when i yeah so there's a question on do we need to further ban chinese apps or chinese companies to prevent cyber attacks and stop chinese companies in 5g auctions coming up uh that's a that's a very good question and uh, it actually uh, uh the ban has a lot of geopolitical implications on why it has uh, why it has happened and uh, while uh, while we are considering that uh, you know a lot of people uh, people who Uh, have a general understanding of the subject might talk that you know uh, we are not able to do anything on the board borders or we are not able to cross the borders but uh, we have to remember that we live in a world of asymmetric uh, warfare and uh, we need to uh, we need to actually develop uh, one concept which uh, was uh, spoken by one of the experts who came up for one of our programs on china which we did recently uh, her name is cleo pascal and uh, she's a very renowned social <coughs> analyst and uh, from chatham house in uk and she said that uh, probably uh, china assesses power in the international system with the uh, by a system known as comprehensive national power where every single component of uh, the country uh, they analyze and num- uh, put it in numeric value to see that how a country uh, is powerful in the international system and uh, she very interestingly highlighted that uh, to counter china's comprehensive national power we need something known as comprehensive national defense and uh, we need to defend against any type of intrusion which uh, we live in an age of asymmetric warfare we can be attacked through the cyber space by uh, dumping of goods in our market by destroying our msmes or small small businesses we can do uh, it can be done in any other way and uh, this is where the uh, ban on chinese apps uh, comes into play and i think uh, it has been a master stroke by the government if you ask me because it depreciated the value of uh, the said chinese company uh, to a great extent uh, because india is one of the largest markets uh, where it is present so of course uh, in terms of the data and the uh, data which is achieved from the user patterns or anything else in terms of the preferences what uh, the people using these chinese ha- apps have it goes into actually feeding uh, the development of uh, systems which can again be used uh, in the future because we know the usage patterns or the development patterns which have been there through the apps so definitely until we have certain assurances that's why i said that in the future uh, businesses will look for cyber assurances before uh, let's say investing in some other countries unless this is done and uh, we we know that for instance in some countries uh, they have asked uh, for europe is uh, now going to ask china to sign a clause where it said that it would not use this for any negative purposes i mean again that's very foolhardy to think of is what i feel uh, but uh, yes uh, in terms of technology uh, uh, we need to we need to like i say diversify and that's probably the only way to uh, beat this whole uh, 
whole circular problem which we have. Okay, Vignesh, uh, Vignesh, yeah. one second, Vignesh, why here? here? Uh, just before you go to the next question, because that's a, that's a very interesting question, I'm seeing that. Uh, for all the participants, please, uh, you do see the mentee.com feedback session. You can in parallel continue with your feedbacks while uh, the presenter goes ahead with the further questions. You can scan the QR code on your mobile. It will take you directly to that mentee or you can go to the mentee and, and then do the, you know, it's a quick one. Please make sure that you put in your feedback. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, we can go to the next session. Susi Tyagarajan. Okay. Uh, Thank so you. The question is on Carnegie's Cyber Norms Index. Um, uh, I would I would not be able to answer that before looking into that is what I would say, and uh, I would just leave the name of the book then uh, in the uh, comment section as a reply to that or uh, in the in the uh, chat box. Um, I think I think the questions are done. Uh, so, uh, Sivadi, I think you had a few questions. So I could yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, share the book of the stuck net. Okay, yeah. So uh, just. Uh, a couple of questions, you know, based on the presentation. Uh, uh, I think there is one question which come and came on this uh, chat window, which probably. Okay, there is a, there is a question from Rahul Madhavan, which he has put in panelist. Okay? okay, so I'll just see what is the question. Where is it? Hold on. Okay, uh, the question here is uh, how India is working with other countries. This is Rahul's question, not mine, Vignesh. How India okay. is working with other countries in putting in place deterrent measures to cybercrime. I think to stop cybercrime is what he meant. What about extradition, freezing of assets of criminals, blacklisting in certain countries, etc.? Okay, uh, so this uh, is being done in the uh, actual space of organized crime and uh, when we look at it we have several um, several type of mechanisms through which uh, we are able to uh, we are able to get uh, we are able to get this uh, data or in terms of stop uh, cyber criminals uh, from uh, you know having a field day in, on our behalf so um, Yes, uh, but in terms of uh, cyber crimes, like I said, one problem is that uh, the traceability, for instance, with Stuxnet uh, also as a case in point, where we looked at it, we understood that we could see uh, there are various assumptions or it is also known as to how it got into the Natanz facility uh, in Iran, but uh, not really who put it there or from where did it come from. Uh, we can assume that with the complexity required, you required an agency which has a state-based backing. Uh, so that uh, that becomes an issue in terms of tracing it. Um, in, in the case of North Korea as well, uh, the FBI has put out a lookout notice for who they think is the person responsible for the uh, Bangladesh Central Bank, which was uh, attacked. And uh, so that is an issue in terms of when it comes to cyber crime. Um, but uh, certain protocols are in place in terms of money laundering or any other activities which are done through the proceeds which are got through cyber crime, whether it's in terms of uh, legislations and uh, regulations which are there, uh, which are governed through various acts with different countries. Um, but uh, again, uh, cyber criminals or any other criminals for that matter, if they also launch attacks, um, they, uh, they route their money or any proceeds through informal networks such as Hawala, for instance, which is uh, not really traceable. And uh, if you would have seen recently that uh, the uh, National Investigation Agency has uh, has posted, I mean, uh, has booked a case uh, against uh, Zakir Naik uh, because he had, he has uh, sent um, money from Malaysia for a perpetrated terror attack uh, to take place in India. Um, so uh, the traceability again of that uh, type of a thing um, because of usage of Hawala channels, for instance, to transfer money has become very difficult. So that would remain a major challenge even though we may be able to trace an attack or 
try to understand how it happens or we may have regulations in place to extradite people uh, pinpointing becomes a major problem in that yeah. thanks vignesh um okay thanks for sharing the book uh, the Sorry. name of the book is countdown to zero day yeah that's yeah. The book on the stocks net thanks thanks for thanks for uh, sharing that i can see it on the chat window really appreciate that um just a couple of questions from my side i mean uh, before i proceed i just wanted to remind everyone to use the menti qr code and punch in the feedback if you have not done so already please uh vignesh uh, you know in one of the slides you talked about people the the committee will ask about the uh, here is a menti code please use them for qr code and we can leave it on the screen right now we are going to leave it on the screen while we talk about further questions uh vignesh you talked about uh, cyber assurance you know if you are setting up businesses will start asking about cyber assurance i do not know whether businesses or even nation states might ask for cyber assurance before their critical businesses might start operations uh especially with respect to the atmanirbhar uh, bharat scheme right. which is being you know propagated by the government um you know there is going to be a cyber assurance ask to the government that you are and and i know that you know we are setting up a, as a country we are setting up a particular infrastructure um a security and there is a cso for the country etc but coming from the isaka point of view and since the, most of these are isaka members and they are all you know into audit and risk mitigation and management etc you know do you think from a geopolitical angle because of the geopolitical angle and the cyber assurance which involves more than what we typically do in auditing a system how do you think from a geopolitical impact will did it will it alter the way we audit or we will will it alter the way we do risk quantification um um see i mean uh, when we factor in uh, things like geopolitics i mean they had to be i mean uh, i i see that uh, some part of it does figure in when we talk about uh, global security or operations and others we look at these factors as well but i i feel that uh, they need to move from uh, a peripheral positioning in terms of when we uh, you know understand what are the threats and uh, looking at it so this is uh, in terms of the second part of the answer uh, question which you asked me about how do we really factor them in and uh, for instance i'll i'll give you an example uh, 